Hello. Today we'll start our journey into logic by introducing a formal language. A formal language contains a particular set of symbols that are defined clearly and unambiguously, and in which there are strict rules that determine what we can or cannot do with those symbols. But you may be asking, why can we study arguments in English or in any other natural language? After all, there are English words that are used to introduce premises and conclusions, and there are phrases for expressing logical relations such as if, then, neither, nor, and others like that. Well, to see why it is necessary to introduce a special language, think about how vague and ambiguous English words are. Think about how the way in which we interpret them depends on the context in which we find ourselves. For instance, we all know what the word bald means, but just when does a person count as bald? Sure, somebody with a shiny, completely hairless head would count as bald. But what about a person with one hair, or with two hairs, or with a hundred hairs? There just isn't a sharp line dividing the bald from the non-bald. And the same happens with other words. Think of rich, famous, far, fast, heavy, etc. And talking about heavy, this word illustrates another characteristic, which is this. Something will count as heavy depending on the context. Surely, a kindergartner who weighs 85 pounds would count as heavy. But a sumo wrestler with the same weight would not be heavy at all. Also, think of terms like bat, which can be a flying mammal or a sporting implement, or bank. So words like this clearly have multiple unrelated meanings. Or consider an apparently unambiguous word like city. Well, city is also ambiguous in a, in a subtle sense. The word city might refer to its people or its inhabitants, as when you talk about the city that never sleeps. It might refer to its administration, uh, which is a legal institution, such as uh, when you say the, the city imposed a ban on smoking. Or the word can refer to a set of buildings and infrastructure, as when you say that uh, the city of Greenville, Missouri, was moved upriver because of the frequent flooding. So the English language is a pretty slippery affair. And the same can be said about any other human language used for everyday communication. But our study of reasoning requires precision. Studying reasoning is hard enough, and all the unclarity built into English and other natural languages makes it even harder. Luckily, some very smart people have invented artificial systems that have all the clarity and economy that English lacks. The downside is that they're also limited and impoverished, but you'll have plenty of chance to see all that for yourself in future lessons. So, these artificial languages are simplified systems, which are perfectly transparent to us. We really know how they work. Unlike English. The simplest of all the languages that we're going to study is what is called sentential logic, or propositional logic. Following Teller's textbook, we're, we'll call it sentential logic, or SL for short. All the other more complex systems that we'll see in the course build on sentential logic. So, if you don't have a good grasp on SL, you won't be able to understand those systems either. So, it's very important to pay attention to SL. We use SL to represent arguments that we usually express in English. Eventually, what we're going to do is that we're going to take arguments in English, translate them into our unambiguous language SL, and then use the tools that that language makes available to us to rigorously test the argument for validity and uh, other logical properties that we'll study in due course. Now, SL is used to represent only certain aspects of English, namely the ones involving sentences and the logical connectives. And these, the sentences and logical connectives, are precisely the building blocks of SL. So, to a first approximation, we can say that SL is the logic of sentences and connectives. You already have some idea of what an English sentence is. What about connectives? Well, there are words and word groups like and, or, if then, unless, and similar ones that we use to combine sentences into bigger sentences. For instance, if we have the English sentences Al sleeps and Mary runs, we can use the English connective and to build the sentence Al sleeps and Mary runs. So, some of the elements of a cell correspond to sentences and others correspond to connectives. The first component of our artificial language SL is the sentence letters. In SL, we use uppercase letters to stand for any English statement, no matter how long or complex. So, this is our first building block, 
sentence letters used to represent English sentences. For instance, A could be Al likes Beth, B could be Claire hates Bob, C could be Dave really wants to go to France sometime this year, and D could be anything you want. Then we have the connectives. Just as it happens in English, the job of SL connectives is to take sentences and form larger sentences out of them. Among the connectives in SL are this squiggle, which we call the tilde, the ampersand, and the V, which, to a certain extent, correspond to not, and, and or, respectively. So, what they do is that they combine sentences, according to specific rules, to form larger sentences. For instance, suppose A stands for Al likes to dance. Then, tilde A would mean Al doesn't like to dance, or it's not the case that Al likes to dance. Or, let B represent Beth hates lentils. Then A ampersand B would mean Al likes to dance and Claire hates lentils. Notice that we can take sentences that already have connectives and then use more connectives on them to make even larger sentences. So, tilde A, as we saw, means Al doesn't like to dance. And tilde B would mean Beth doesn't hate lentils. Then we could join the sentences with the V to represent Al doesn't like to dance or Claire doesn't hate lentils. Like this. With what we've seen so far, we can establish a first distinction among SL sentences. First, we have those sentences that don't have other sentences as parts. These are called atomic sentences, and they are basically the sentence letters. Second, we have compound sentences, which do have other sentences as parts. These parts can be any sentences. They can be atomic sentences or even other compound sentences. Consider these examples. So the sentence letter C on its own counts as an atomic sentence, since it doesn't contain any other sentences. Example 2 is a compound sentence, and it's built out of two atomic sentences, A and B. Last, example 3 is also a compound sentence, but it contains other compound sentences and components, namely A ampersand B and tilde C.